Thank you, guys. Thank you. I heard that you're a very astute audience has gathered. And so my guess is that you are very alert, even though it's very early. So I'd like to present to you, and although many of us are allergic to exams, I'd like to present to you a test right from the get-go. This is called an awareness test. I want you to see, if you can, how many times a basketball is passed. We're going to see how good you notice things. Check it out. Yeah, it's easy to miss something you're not looking for. The question is, what are you looking for? When you think of the power of a network and the power of an organization, what is truly your focus? Your focus will determine how you will live out your life and what will really be success for you. When I think about focus, I think about misplaced perspectives. What are we focusing on right now that maybe God is not wanting us to focus upon? I was trying to think about this. If Satan had a strategy, how would he paralyze the church? What do you think it'd be? Would it be something overt? My guess not. It'd probably be more subtle and covert. My best strategy I could think of for Satan would be he'd think that we're probably doing something when we're maybe doing nothing at all. How about when it comes to spiritual gifts? Let's just look at a couple misplaced focuses, possibly, that maybe you didn't notice. When we talk about spiritual gifts, we look at Ephesians 4, we look at 1 Corinthians 12, and we'll talk about the diversity of the body. And pastors will talk eloquently about this, and even corporate executives about their companies. Look at all the gifts of our company. But have you ever taken it outside of your local institution and thought of gifts as maybe a city type of perspective? that maybe this organization or this church has unique giftings, and those are the dominant gifts of that church? Have you taken it to a national scene or maybe an international macro region? You see, gifts could be something more than just your church's gifts or your organization's. You really need to collaborate with the whole body if we're going to re really make a great impact. How about when it comes to focus on the city? You'll find one of the most attractive things that people are talking about now is a city focus. And so the whole movement of church planning is toward the city. How do we define city? Is city just simply a downtown place where there's buildings that are going up really high? Is that just the city? Where do you draw the lines in the city? What streets? Is the Queens a part of that? Is Brooklyn? Where is the city for you? How about thinking of city more in terms of not just high rises, but how about metropolis? Polis, city. Could it be that the greatest cities are actually the metropolis cities, where there's a synergy be both between the urban and the suburban? How can you discount the suburban? Just because you look at the middle class, you know, and the elite, and they're the outsiders. Think about just even New York. People work in the city. They live where? In New Jersey. But we say we live only in New York. Are we living in illusion? Doesn't the suburban area affect also the urban area? How do you separate those two? When I went from a global, uh, to Thailand globally and I, I checked out what was happening, people try to address uh, sex trafficking uh, and prostitution industry only in Bangkok. And that's one way to look at it, but you're having to do a lot of relief emergency stuff on the back end. When we really dove into this, we found out that if we're really going to deal with this systemically, we have to go to the northeastern regions in the Isan area because most of the prostitutes were actually coming from these, the, the armpit of Southeast Asia, they call it, 
where the young girls and the families didn't have enough money to support themselves. So where did the girls go? They went to Bangkok. So what should have been done systemically? Well, we need to help them grow economically. We have to give them education. If you just address a city's ill, what we know as the downtown area, the big, bustling, sexy part, we're going to miss out on really where the roots of the problem are. So let's not just talk about city, urban, downtown buildings. Let's think bigger than that. Let's think about the metropolis. Let's think about rural and also the urban context, how there's a synergy between the two. You can't have one without the other. How about the other things that we're not noticing? How about when it comes to churches? You'll find that churches spend a lot of money on buildings. I'm one of them, right? And when we spend money on buildings, what happens is a lot of our resources get tapped into the facilities. I'm not talking about just this one, because I, I, I put money into a facility too. So buildings aren't bad. But what happens is as we focus on buildings, it puts a lot of resources in structures that go vertical, and then we hire professional staff. And if you look at most churches' budgets, they were 60 to 85 percent focused upon the infrastructure of that local institution. Is that good stewardship? Could it be that maybe Satan has a plan that we focus more on structures than maybe people? Are we noticing the right things? How about when it comes to just sex and gender? You know, uh, do our denominations, do our churches focus more upon the male? And have we forgot about the female? Oh, we say we're not misogynist. Of course we don't hate women. But do we kind of put them under? You'll find the greatest societies are really bent towards loving women and children and also the elderly. How do you elevate women in your organization? How do you elevate children? How do you elevate the elderly? If you look at, uh, from a, again, a global perspective, when they look at the West, especially the East, they think we're barbaric because we put our elderly in nursing homes. And we kind of cordon them off into a section. And those elderly sometimes only see their families once a year. Is there something wrong with our society? Are we missing something? How about when it comes to worship? How do you define the deeper life? And I'm finding this consistent. When we think of maturity and you're growing in Christ, what does that look like? For many of us, it's sitting in a room listening to a speaker. And then we do this Sunday after Sunday, year after year, and that's the deeper Christian life, is being dazzled and then entertaining some thoughts that we can articulate to somebody else and sound intelligent. And then we go deeper by doing that in a small group. You know, I like the Jesuit philosophy of worship, which I think is based on Isaiah 58, where true worship is not just singing and praying in a structure together. True worship is feeding the poor, caring for the widow. It has an activist slant. When you think of Jesuits, I think of Ignatius, the father, and he, he was so right, I think, and appropriate when he saw some of his, the, the priests as they were praying a long, long time, and he said, hey, guys, let's stop. This has been 45 minutes. Now it's time to go do something. They have a philosophy called one foot raised. It kind of looks like, you know, the kung fu type of thing, right? One foot raised. And I love that concept because it shows that I'm ready to go. God's, if God's called me, I'm ready to do something, man. Are we bent towards action? Have we kind of moved toward misplaced focuses? Are we really noticing what God notices? What I want to talk about today is really the power of the network, not in terms of quantitatively, like large numbers, but qualitatively. What does the powerful network really look like if you were to break it down and deconstruct it? I want to show you something. Look at this water drop. My friend, friend Shane Hips, I was in Hawaii with him a couple weeks ago, and he showed this. I go, let me borrow that clip, and I want you to see this water drop and see the power of a water drop.
and you thought it was just one drop. You see, there's power in the small. There's a beauty to it if you really take it apart. But our nations and our culture is fascinated by the big. So when we think of networks, we think we have to build a big network. When maybe the most powerful networks are the small ones that actually do something. The power of the small. When I think about trying to create big things, I, try to th I talked to a Japanese farmer and uh, talked about gardening in, in Orange County. He's one of the best. And he says, you know, if you get uh, the watermelon seed and give it the perfect conditions of sun, you know, fertilizer, water, and everything's just right, they can grow really huge on the vine. In fact, I look on the internet this morning, and they said that the watermelon, the largest one ever was in 2009, it was 268.8 pounds. Amazing. Watermelons can grow pretty huge. And he says if they grow like that, he goes, well, you know what we call that state? I said, what do you call that? He goes, we call that vegetation. It's vegetating. Interesting. There's another seed, not a watermelon seed, it's, like, it's called a mutant seed. When you look at a mutant seed, a lot of times you go, man, that's kind of odd, that's weird, that's ugly. You want to throw that thing away because everything else looks so beautiful. He says, no, because the farmers know the mutant seeds are the most valuable seeds. The mutant seeds are the ones that nature or God has prepared to handle the conditions of the changing environment. So they're the seeds that handle the transition of society or the domains of the land. The mutant seeds are the priceless ones. When you look about your organization and you look at who you want to impact and who you want to impress, are they the mutant seeds? When you think about God wanting to change a nation, changing a city, who did he go after? Just the masses? No, you sought intentional effort to go after the mutants the outcast, the one that wasn't the same. I love that about Jesus. When I think about this, I, I also consider, you know, how we, we measure things a lot. You know, we, we measure things kind of like this on a chart. You know, if you do a chart, right, and you think about financial records, how's that chart supposed to look? It's supposed to look like this, right? Up and to the right. Is this the way most of life is? What's the reality? It's kind of... It's all over the place. But our vision of success is up and to the right, inflated numbers. I want to challenge you to consider this, that maybe the greatest number is zero. Could zero be the most successful number? What if you had zero orphans in New York City? What if you had zero foster children? What if you had zero crime rate, no murders? Could zero maybe be a more accurate number than the inflated hype numbers that we often throw out? Maybe zero is the best number. Number I call that mission zero. When I think about numbers, I, I, was, uh, uh, I was working with this guy named Boyd Kosiabon because I was trying to scale things. My original vision of the church was to grow as big as possible to influence a city. So I was going to have thousands in these cities all over the world. So I went into Bangkok with that same vision. And when I was there, I met this one guy named Boyd Kosiabon who was the, uh, an amazing musician, composer. I later discovered that he influences out of 65 million people, his brand influences 50 million people. He's the most popular brand in, in Thailand. As I started working with him and started thinking about numbers, I felt God saying to me, okay, yeah, go ahead and build a church of 30,000, even globally, Dave. I have one guy that can influence 50 million people. So if numbers is your game, one person. So it made me rethink, what am I doing about my development of people? Am I focusing on people or just producing numbers? Because you're going to find this. If you're just about reaching as many people as possible, you're going to create a one-size-fits-all product. And then you're going to find your potency gets diffused. And so does those individuals. And then later you're going to discover that the creatives and the entrepreneurs, they don't want to be a part of your organization. Because it smells too common. It's too tight. It's too black and white. And so they're left out of the church. What I find God doing is he focuses on the small. And I started thinking some more, and God brought this guy, uh, this guy in my group. He was asked to be part of Navy SEAL Team 6. They're the ones that took down Osama bin Laden. And uh, he, I, I said, tell me, you know, uh, about your group. And I found out there's a group, this Navy SEAL Team 6. You know how many there are 
in that division, only three to 400. They have a support team of 1,400. You know how big their budget is? The size of the Marines. You don't have to be big to take down a city. I looked at this in Acts, because I've been meditating in Acts for the last couple of years, just taking it apart, because I feel something's missing in my life, because I know how to strategize and build things and scale, but something was missing. And I started looking at Acts, and I saw in Acts 19, when Ephesus was turned upside down, the evil was screwed. They were getting mad at each other. There's a riot that was caused in the city from a group of men. There's 12 of them. 12 people turned the city upside down. Hmm. We don't have to be big. The power of the small. I think of Sean King, who's working with zealots now. He started a little thing called Twit Change. He raised in a few years $5 million to impact people. He sold it to a for-profit company. Now he's starting a new thing called HopeMob.org. Check it out sometime. Sean King, this one person, is influencing thousands, if not millions of people. You look at the revolution known as the Arab Spring in the Middle East. It was caused by a social media revolution. Just a few people. You don't have to be big now. Power the small. When I think of the small, I think of the weak. When you construct assessment processes and you try to find the best people, remember, when you think of small, again, you're thinking you know, usually in power frames, big, bigness. But think about the weak and how do we look at the weak? Well, we look at the weak as people maybe in pain or who have addictions or struggles. Check this out. If you have a pain or a weakness, what do you do with it? We tend to cover it up. At best, in the Christian world, we confess our sins or we confess our pain. Tell me what happens if you keep confessing your addictions. What if you keep telling you have a porn problem or an alcohol problem or a lust problem or a greed problem or a pride problem? What if you talk about that every week in your small group? <laughs> What's going to happen? Oh, well, they're going to cycle you out probably, maybe put you into a 12-step group. Uh, or if it's a Christian one, hey, we can celebrate your recovery. But you are now marked. You're not mainstream anymore, bro. What we need to do is maybe embrace our humanity. We gotta embrace it. This is Romans 7, the conflicted Paul. He tried to, you know, he tried to, uh, uh, he said, I, I'm a son of God, I try to do good, but yet I can't complete it, right? He lived in that tension. It was a management of that tension. It's powerful. And then eventually what you see with pain, if you're going to keep moving forward, is you've got to see it as a guide, like the cross. It guided Jesus. He moved towards it. Uh, if you look about life perspective and trying to assess where to go, look at your pain. It, it'll help. The pain that God gave you will be used to comfort others. It's part of your destiny. And then what happens is your pain becomes also your gift. Uh, where you'll, you know, a lot of you pray, God, I want to make a difference in this world. God says, okay. Yeah, if you're going to impact a lot of people, they can't relate to your strengths, but they can relate to your weakness. They can relate to your pain. So he gives you that actually as a gift to connect to people. So how do you see the world? I want you to check something, something out again. And I want, I want you to see not only the power of the small, but I want you to see the power of systems. Check out this pictures of some fast food. I know that some of you like fast food. Let's look at the Whopper. That's a beautiful hamburger, isn't it? I know New Yorkers like their meat. What do you really get? <laughs> okay, some of you go, you know, I like chicken sandwiches, though, not beef. Okay, you're a little healthier. Let's look at the chicken sandwich. There it is. What do you really get? Let's show the next one. It's nasty right there, man. That is nasty. That's, <laughs> that's, that's heart attack food right there. Okay, okay, fish sandwich. You go, I'm really healthy. I love my fish. What do you really get? Look at that, man. The tartar sauce is hanging out there. <laughs> okay, so your systems, you create these systems, right? The power of systems then. Again, let's look, deconstruct it. Let's break it down. You create a system. You think it produces that great whopper. But what do you really get when you produce a system? I want to tell you how we... The, the, the philosophy we need to carry when it comes to the system of, 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 that we develop. Uh, usually when you think about, start with the church, and you can look at, I look at your organizations like churches, to be honest. 
So I work with, with corporate executives and pastors, and they're very similar guys. What happens is you, your vision is to go ahead and impact the world, right? So what, what's our philosophy? We want to take them out of the world, put them into the pews of our churches, and they learn our brand. They have to wear our T-shirts. They have to learn our nomenclature. And then awkwardly, we send them back into the world with our T-shirts on. No wonder entrepreneurs and creators feel so stupid. They don't know what to say. They can't figure it out. They got to be a pastor or a missionary to really be effective. That's crazy. What's really the nature of a great system? For especially the church or a great organization? Well, it's focused on what I call human development. Okay, so here you got the people, and then you got your little self and your group of people that want to impact the world. You're supposed to go in the world. You're supposed to go find out their destiny, develop them. Not, they're not supposed to come back here and just follow your destiny. The best companies will develop their people. The power of a system. Our systems need to be more creative, collaborative, customized, and culturally adaptive. I don't have time to talk about any more of that part. I want to finish with this. The power of the spirit. This is the power of the small when it comes to networks. It's the power of systems and then the power of the spirit. And this is the most important piece if you're going to make an impact in the city or in your company. This is the piece I missed out on. There is a network of power in the human side, right? Humans by themselves are beautiful and they can produce great work. But it becomes amazing if you can leverage the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is the part that we're not very good at because our systems since the Enlightenment period have focused on the academic and the non-academic nature of education. And they produced just these big minds. Our bodies are just like vehicles that carry around our minds. When really, it's not it's supposed to me meant to be lived in whole. And so how do we develop the whole person? Well, it really takes the Holy Spirit to energize us so that everything can be activated to its fullest potential. The question I want to ask you is, are you developing that side? I was, uh, you know, I was thinking about this this morning. I was, I was, I was running through Soho. I, I took a run, and I was just thinking about how, man, we just celebrated Easter. And, man, on Easter, we talk about the theology of resurrection and how God is this miraculous God. He can raise the dead. But I think about the other 51 Sundays of the year, do we have that same type of message? Oh, yeah, do you believe in miracles? Yeah, I believe in them, but not some of those miracles. Did you put God in a box? Hmm. I did. I remember I was in yogurt land, a great frozen yogurt place in California, and this guy came up to me, because I, I come from a, a background where, where all these gifts were kooky and spooky. And so I didn't want to talk about like spiritual gifts like these ones, the weird ones to me. But then he looked at me and said, Dave, I think you got this unique gift of apostleship and leadership. I go, that's cool. And he goes, hey, would you like me to pray for you? I go, yeah, man, I need prayer. He took me out in the middle of a sidewalk where all these people, hundreds of people were passing me by. I thought he'd take me into a corner. And then he did the charismatic thing, Rudy. Man, he just started screaming, Lord, bless Dave. He was spit was flying, you know. Bless Dave, God, come on, he'd give him that anointing. And people are walking by, and I'm getting more embarrassed. Seriously, by minute three, I had no idea what he was saying. I was going out of my mind, and then by minute eight, I'm totally numb, just of embarrassment. And then I thought I heard God's voice in a nice, gentle way say, Dave, oh, you're so embarrassed about wanting to receive my power. How sad. I said, is that my life, God? I'm just really embarrassed. And I'm really living for the public approval. Hmm. I said, okay, God, let's see your power. And it started showing up in a lot of ways. I remember this guy started speaking in church, and he came, and he was given an invitation. He goes, oh, my right arm hurts. Uh, during the invitation, Dave, can you take over? Because it's killing me. I go, okay. And then as he's, uh, as he's, as he's coming off the stage, he goes, oh, I know what's wrong. There's somebody here with a arm, problem with their right arm. If we pray, we, they can probably be healed. Remember, our church has never seen stuff like this. I, he goes, you mind if I pray for him? I go, yeah, but nothing weird, bro. I said, nothing weird. <laughs> I go, we can pray for him like we typically pray, but nothing weird. He goes, okay, I'll do it. 
And he says, anybody have a problem with your right arm? Raise your left hand. <laughs> and there was a guy in the front row, Calvin. There's right in the front row. And he's, and he's the only guy who raised his hand. I missed a thousand people in that service. And, he's, and he didn't do anything weird. He said, in the name of Jesus, be healed. He said, move your arm around. He said, I'm not trying to psychologically manipulate you. Come on, move it wildly. And the guy goes, my arm's healed. I don't feel any pain. Then he looked at my congregation who had never seen anything like this before. Does anybody else need healing today? Come on up, we'll pray for you. Half the congregation came forward. I said, oh, this is kind of outside my box. <laughs> and then it really struck me and it hit home. Come on now, listen to me. This is really important because, again, the power of the network is not the human network, it's the Holy Spirit network. And we have not tapped into that yet efficiently. Again, we're efficient, but we're not effective. And it takes the Holy Spirit to make you really effective, to go deep into systemic oppression and injustices. You have to lean into that because you cannot combat evil. Come on. You think you're that good to combat evil? Place yourself in Skid Row, even in Los Angeles. Place yourself there where 40 to 60% of those who are homeless have mental health challenges. You can handle that? You need the Holy Spirit. It hit home when it came to my daughter. And my daughter was struggling with a lot of different stuff. So was my son. And uh, they were struggling. And, uh, and uh, I was just wiped out, my wife and I. And we said, why don't you go to a, my, one of my friends' place? And she went. And then while she was listening, something happened. Where she said, Dad, I started hearing God's voice. I go, really? She says, yeah. I go, what did you hear? Oh, the same thing you heard when you started New Song. Psalm 40. You had mud all over your bodies, and I took you out of the muddy clay. I placed your feet upon a rock, and I gave you a new song. I heard that, Dad, and I just started weeping. And my daughter, who's like a beautiful girl, most popular like in her high school, she's not going to weep in front of other people. She just started sobbing uncontrollably. A young woman named Aria came up to her, laid her hands on her, and said, Karis, do you mind if I pray for you? Karis said, yeah, go ahead. Aria prayed. Mind you, Karis said nothing to her. Aria said, okay, Karis, I got a vision for you. I saw mud all over your body, and God washed you completely clean. He placed your feet on a rock, and he gave you a new song. Listen, don't fool yourself that the power is just, just in your strategy. The power is in the spirit. Leverage that power. That network of the Trinity won't do you wrong. 